Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, I'm probably the person standing between you and my time, and I've been reliably informed that uh, I have about 15 minutes to be able to do this, probably less than that. So we'll just start turning into this. I am glad that I'm seeing many faces that are familiar to me, people that went to medical school together, and they are now very mature young doctors. So my name is Dr. Dave Ujijo. Uh, I'm a medical officer. I'm the chair of KME Planetary Health uh, Committee. I'm equally a founder of an organization called Green Health Focus, which is a new organization that deals with the nexus between climate change and health. I'm equally a member of an organization called United Nations Former Convention on Climate Change, an official youth working group uh, called UNFCC Yango. Yes, so I've been requested to speak about planetary health. Planetary health is a new field, and this concept was first coined somewhere in 2015 by the Rockefeller Foundation. And this concept is basically a field which is transdisciplinary or a multidisciplinary field that deals with the relationship or the nexus between human health, the health of our environment, the health of our planet, and nowadays people are also putting the issue of animal health into it. That relationship is what you want to talk about. So some define it as the health of human civilization and all the natural systems that depend on it. But the most important thing is just knowing that it's the field that deals with your health, the environment, and the health of our planet. Yes, so what is important for us is what is planetary health in the context of healthcare provision in our country? Why are we talking about it? Because many of the times, as healthcare practitioners, doctors, patients come to us. For example, a patient comes to you and they have malaria. And this woman maybe has a, a child who is five years old who has severe malaria. You treat them, they go back home. After some two months, they come back again with malaria. You give them antibiotics, they go back home. After another three months, they come back to you with the same condition. But we fail to realize that we don't really explain to our patients what is the relationship between the disease they have and the environment they come from. Where they come from? Is that woman sleeping under insect, uh, the treated uh, mosquito nets? Is there a nearby bush that is not cut? Is there a stagnant water body around there that is not drained? So without explaining that, then we tend to have patients who come every time with conditions that we are not able to handle. This is a, a picture of us at Kitengela. And for those of you who have phones, if you Google Kitengela dust, this Kitengela dust. It's an area that is known for dust and air pollution. And uh, we went there to do a free medical camp and a free health talk to the people of Kitengela. And what we came out that we realized is that many of our people did not realize that the respiratory conditions that he came with those upper respiratory conditions, the exacerbated asthma conditions, were actually related to the environment where they are living. And therefore, we realize there's a big gap when it comes to matters of planetary health. Next slide. And then next. Yes. So there's currently the elephant in the room, which is called climate change. And there's something called a typical planet crisis which is basically climate change by diversity laws and pollution. Currently, according to WHO, climate change is the biggest threat, the biggest global health threat to humanity. And people say that climate crisis is actually a healthcare crisis. And it's stipulated that by the year 2050, if you do not do much, then you'll be able to have 250,000 additional death every year as a result of climate-induced threats. So, this is the most probably important slide that I want to tell on, and then probably in the next five minutes I'll be out of here. Now, these are the major health risks associated with climate change. And just to pick a few of them, if you have uh, climate change and it's impacting on your human health, take a case of extreme weather events like flooding or extreme drought. When you have flooding, for those who come from at least where the flooding is known to happen, 
If you have gone to a place called Kano near Kisumu, what you are told is you just hear noises at night. And before you know it, in a few hours, your house is flooded. And because you don't want to be drowned, you have to run up and down to save your life. In that process, people tend to get injured. And sometimes even have people drowning during those extreme weather events. That is what we know. But again, when we talk about respiratory illnesses, as a result of air pollution, we're having exacerbation of respiratory illnesses like asthma, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and your medics, you know that. As that of indoor air pollution due to use of fossil fuels or the biogas that we use in our houses, people tend to have chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. When it comes to the issue of malnutrition and foodborne illnesses, what is the relationship? Take a case of extreme drought, uh, and people who are farmers have probably planted crops, and due to that drought, maybe they have no produce for them that year. What happens is that we have food insecurity. When you have food insecurity, the issues of malnutrition and that people who are at risk to that, children under five, the elderly, they start suffering from malnutrition and foodborne diseases. Actually, in Africa now, over 200 million Africans have a problem with food insecurity. Look at uh, heat-related illnesses. Probably not very common in our setup, but currently 2023 has been postulated to be the hottest year ever since the planet Earth was probably created. Or for those who believe there was the Big Bang theory, since that time of Big Bang theory, or for the religious people, that is the hottest year that we've ever had. And July was the hottest month. When you have those extreme temperatures, people tend to have what is called heat waves and heat strokes, okay? Yes. There are cases of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases associated with animals, yes. And currently we are seeing many of those zoonotic diseases that are neglected tropical diseases, like the issue of Kalazar, okay? Leishmaniasis, and the issue of uh, human African trypanosomiasis, the one that causes sleeping sickness. They have a relationship with the environment. All this, just to uh, save time, on matters of waterborne diseases, currently we are experiencing a lot of flooding in our country. And those flooding tend to interfere with what is called the social determinants of health, like access to clean and safe water for drinking, access to clean air. So a problem with clean and safe water for drinking, people tend to have diarrheal diseases on the rise. Okay, let me mention the issue of the last two, which are probably the most important for us, vector borne diseases. As a result of our warming climate, we are starting to see many of the vector borne diseases like malaria on the rise. For those who have stayed in Nairobi for long, they know that Nairobi probably was not a malaria endemic region. But currently we are seeing many of the cases of malaria being reported. In Africa, according to WHO, we are having a 13% increase in malaria cases. If you compare the period between early 19th, 19th, 1990 to 2001 uh, and the period between 2013 and 2022, according to a, a data which was released yesterday by the Lancet Canton on Health and Climate Change, matters of malaria cases are on the rise. It is a disease called dengue fever, which in our country commonly is in the coastal region. It's on the rise. And in Africa, dengue fever has risen by 37% from the period between 2013 to the year 2022. There is the issue of Zika virus, chikungunya virus. All these diseases thrive in a warm environment. And that is the effect we are now seeing in matters of infectious disease. When it comes to mental health, and I've heard many of you have spoken about it, if you are a farmer in Northeastern, and your whole livelihood depends on livestock, and as a result of drought, which is prolonged drought or extreme, when the event, you've lost all your cattle, and all of a sudden you cannot take your children to school. Probably a place that you used to call home is no longer home. Then you start having psychological stress. Even when you have flooding and people run up and down, without trauma, you start having something called post-traumatic stress disorder. So the issues of mental health rise, 
as a result of climate change. Our healthcare system is the weakest, probably, you'll ever find if you compare with the global norm, especially the healthcare system in the global South Africa, the low and middle income countries. And when you have those problems, then our healthcare system are interfering. Matters of accessibility, because of flooding, you cannot go to the hospital. That accessibility is interfering. Affordability, because you've lost all the things that you probably depended on to access healthcare, and many of our people do not have access to insurance, then accessibility to that healthcare becomes a problem. Then even the quality, because of the destruction of our hostels. Recently, two weeks ago, most likely it's just one week ago, Samburu County had flooding, and there's a sub-county also called Mayarada sub-county, it's a level four hostel. It was destroyed by flooding. So that accessibility and availability and affordability of healthcare for people in Samburu is actually interfering. They cannot be able to access healthcare. Next slide. And next. And uh, Daudi, next. <laughs> so what is important for us is why should you, young healthcare professionals, be equipped with this knowledge? One is the fact that advocacy by young or healthcare professionals, because they're trusted members of the society, has been proven to be very effective. Because many of you, for example, if I take this case of medical students, in Kenya right now, we have 11 universities producing doctors. And these doctors are around 1,000 from each university. No, 1,000 uh, generally for, for the whole country. So that means Kenya produces about 1,000 doctors every year. These doctors, many of them will become medical practitioners. Some will go into policies and work with the ministry. Others will go into research. Others too will upscale and probably go into WHO and make decisions for the planet. That is how important you guys are. And that's why we must be equipped with this knowledge. Currently, we are even talking about the issue of integrating planetary health education into medical school curricula. And it's happening in other countries. Healthcare sector also produces greenhouse gases. And according to statistics, the healthcare industry produces about 4.6% uh, of the total uh, greenhouse gases emission. If that is reduced, you can imagine what we'll be able to decarbonize our world. And that's why we must be able to take the center stage to be able to bring change. Next. If we do that, if we do that, brothers and sisters, then we'll be able to produce many of these advocates will be able to advance matters, planetary health, to be able to save our world. Because this world is what we have in common and we must be able to protect it. I thank you.